I think the bottom line is the end of the end of the pandemic, at least as it relates to the United States, is in sight right now, given all the tools we have to combat this uh, this disease. Now, we still have to get through this Delta wave. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to vaccinate our way out of it. These therapeutics are coming too late to really affect that wave of infection. Um, but once we get through this Delta wave of infection over the course of the next two months, I think that this therapeutic and the other innovations that we've seen coming to market really mark the end of the pandemic for the United States. And we need to think about how we put that, you know, victory uh, side on the side of the White House, how we declare victory over this pandemic, at least here in the United States. All right, so that's Pfizer board member Dr. Scott Gottlieb talking about how we declare victory over the pandemic. Now, his comments came this morning after Pfizer announced that it is stopping a trial for its COVID-19 pill after results show that it cuts the risk of hospitalization by 89%. The company will submit data on the therapeutic to the FDA before Thanksgiving. But Dr. Gottlieb's optimistic view about the end of the pandemic is actually at odds with others in the scientific community who argue that rather than debate how to end the pandemic, we need to debate how to live with it. Now, the reality is that any future containing COVID involves heavy testing. But surging demand for COVID-19 tests from U.S. employers has worsened a nationwide shortage of rapid tests, leading to scarcity and high prices. Now, compare that to Europe. In Britain, you can get free rapid tests delivered to your house on demand. In France, Germany, and Belgium, they're about as expensive as a morning cup of coffee. And they're the same ones that we have right here in the United States. In fact, one company has a virtual lock on the U.S. market. According to Nielsen IQ, Abbott's tests dominate 75% of the market. How did this happen, you might ask? Well, a new report from ProPublica highlights how the U.S. dropped the ball on rapid home tests. The answer appears to be a confounding combination of overzealous regulation, anemic government support, speed bumps that have defined America's testing response from the very beginning of this pandemic. And the report describes companies' painstaking efforts to try and get approval. Quote, we spent our own million dollars developing this thing at the FDA's encouragement, and then they just treat you like a criminal. That's what the head of WHPM, a medical diagnostic manufacturing company, said of his encounters with the FDA. They treat you like a criminal. Now, a separate California diagnostic center uh, descri company described the FDA's unrealistic timelines during the review process. While biopharmaceutical uh, giant Roche told ProPublica that its home tests were rejected because the trials had partly been done in Europe, let's be clear about this. What's going on with this process is the exact opposite of what Dr. Fauci said he wanted back in March. They actually have been saying that for months and months and months that we should be literally flooding the system with easily accessible, cheap, not needing a prescription, point of care, highly sensitive and highly specific. Eight months later, the system is literally not flooded with cheap tests. And there were once hopes of quick, easy saliva tests everywhere. What happened to those? America prides itself on having the greatest healthcare system in the world, but what this investigation lays bare is how the richest country on earth has lagged the world on testing, diagnosing, and crucially, moving on from this pandemic. Joining us now to talk about her report for ProPublica is Lydia DePillis. Also with me is Dr. Nahid Vidalia, founding director of Boston University Center for Emerging Infectious Disease Policy and Research. It's great to have both of you with us. Um, Lydia, I'd like to start with you. Your story is incredibly fascinating here. Uh, and it gets to the question of why can't I just simply go to a pharmacy or even a local library or a public health center and easily get a cheap or free home test? Yeah, thank you so much for that, Ayman. I mean, it's a it's a sad reality at this point in the pandemic. And as we wrote, it's a result of a combination of policy choices. One was to keep a fairly high bar for approval of rapid tests. And the other was to not invest billions of dollars in buying tests and making them available for free. And you just contrast that with how we approached vaccines. Like there was an intense focus on improving a couple of them. You didn't need a ton of them, but they there was a, a real process for doing that. And then the U.S. government bought as many doses as it could get its hands on with the commitment of making one available for free to every American. Too. Um, and that was 
absolutely different from how we have approached testing. That has been very private sector, and yet the FDA is also keeping a very tight hold on the number of tests that can be on the market. And this particular type of test, something that you could take at home, you can get in the pharmacy, is one that has been in particularly short supply because the FDA has been very wary of the accuracy. So, Dr. Bedelia, functionally, how would having mass and free or cheap testing, how would it have changed what happened over the past uh, almost two years, and how could it make things better over the next several months as we see progress on uh, both vaccines as well as therapeutics? Yeah, but we'll write a textbook at some point in the future for public health practitioners like me, and we'll talk about the importance of testing and then use all the examples of how the U.S. failed over the last two years of, as why it's needed. And early on, we failed because by not enough, having enough testing, we didn't have an idea of how big the problem was. And throughout this pandemic, the, the idea of having cheap, affordable tests that are available everywhere, it could make people change their behaviors. You know, you, you saw people who just got frustrated and, and didn't take advantage of any of the non-pharmaceutical interventions that we wanted them to. But if you could link some of those activities that they were able to do, such as potentially going to restaurants to this type of testing, right, you could have identified people who were infected. It could have reduced the amount of transmission that was going on in the communities. I mean, looking forward, right, two new horizons with testing. We've seen the difficulty with the lack of availability for schools for testing and how that's led to clusters of, of cases. Uh, the parents could quickly test them, uh, test their kids before they sent them to school. Two new horizons. Now the mandate with vaccines and, and vaccines versus testing, for example, you're seeing this crunch and moving forward, you may need more tests because we are asking a greater number of people to get tested and potentially either that or, or get test uh, or I'm sorry, get vaccinated or get tested. Last bit. All these oral drugs that we think are promising because people can take them and potentially avoid getting hospitalized early on in their disease, that's dependent on them getting tested within the first five days, for example, for both the Pfizer and the Merck test. So if you don't get your hands on one of these tests, you don't know your status, you, you're, you might as well be in the same place you were before these antivirals were available. Now, Lydia, your reporting focuses on a top health official at the FDA, Tim Stencil. You report that he holds the most day-to-day -day power over whether a test uh, gets approved. How, ha how has his department's handling of testing applications uh, complicated things based on your reporting? Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, they worked really hard in 2020 to vet thousands of applications for tests that are mostly the PCR tests that you have to go to a, um, to a laboratory or a clinic or sometimes a pharmacy to get, but under the supervision of a healthcare provider most of the time. And the next generation of tests were serology tests. These were for antibodies that, um, that would tell you if you've already been infected. And those they decided to let on the market in a really almost unfettered way. Um, and they, when they turned out to be really terribly inaccurate, they withdrew a bunch of them. Um, and they took, they learned that lesson almost too hard because the sort of third generation of tests to come around, these antigen tests, um, they didn't really let out the door um, for much of 2020, uh, especially the ones for home, for home use that you don't need to be under supervision to take. And so they insisted that they be sensitive even for people who don't have symptoms. You know, that makes sense because we do want to test people who don't have symptoms, but they they work best among folks who have a lot of virus in their system. And when you can take them often enough, that might be okay because it catches people who are most likely to pass the disease on to other people. So the European systems where they have mass distribution of tests uh, work when you have to take one to go to the opera or take one to go to school. It's just a very different approach that prioritizes frequency, even if the tests aren't perfectly accurate. So, Dr. Bedelia, I'd like to go back to a point that you mentioned about, you know, when we look back in, uh, in history one day and, and the lessons learned in all of this, one of the major moments was when we saw the government shut down uh, their government-run uh, testing uh, vaccination sites, those mass sites that we saw pop up uh, at stadiums all across the country. Did that make the situation worse? Was that too premature to shut down these testing and, and vaccination sites ahead of the Delta variant? 
and, and I think Delta Variant did change the equation, right? I mean, because I think that we realized that a lot more people needed to be vaccinated for us to to stop the the, the, the transmission because there's a lot more transmissible variant. Uh, I, I do think that we were already reaching a point where we had reached everybody uh, who was very ready to get tested right away. I'm sorry, get vaccinated right away. And 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 we were reaching a point where we, were, where we needed to open up vaccinations in spaces where you need to have conversations with people to allay their fears, to really share the safety data. And and so it made sense to move the vaccines into many, many more places uh, at the at the cost of potentially closing down these, these, these large vaccination sites. However, for testing, I, I think that, you know, again, if, if we've gotten to a point where to make them available, to make them useful, just like the oral antivirals, you know, to make any of these tools useful, they need to be affordable, they need to be available, they need to be accessible to everybody in different geographical areas, and we haven't managed to do that. So it's not so much, you know, one area having a ton of testing, it's testing everywhere, affordable, easily accessible, any time that you need um, to get tested. Lydia, last month the Biden administration announced that it will be uh, spending an additional uh, $2 billion uh, or a $1 billion on top of the $2 billion that were announced back in September to boost access uh, for home testing. Based on your reporting, is that going to be enough? I hope so. I mean, the other thing that they're doing is, is revising the process for approving tests so that it's a little bit less sclerotic so that um, you, the companies don't have to go back and forth with the, with the FDA for months. So hopefully that will get more different types of tests on the market and um, solve some of the supply chain issues, honestly, that have also constricted the availability of tests. Um, and then funding is really key, right? Because that not only makes tests available, it also um, gives companies the confidence to believe that this is a market that will be sustainable for them. Because when you know when vaccines rolled out, a lot of companies thought, oh gosh, you know, this is not something that we can really justify investing in. So I hope so. It would have been way better if it had happened a year ago. Um, but you know, who knows what other variants are around the corner? This could all happen over again. Uh, God forbid. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. it's absolutely inexcusable that we still cannot walk into a pharmacy and anywhere else just to pick a uh, at-home test uh, two years into this pandemic. Lydia DePillis and Dr. Nahid Bedeli, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Greatly appreciated your insights.